Thank you for coming tonight. It is always an honor to represent the Lord Jesus Christ and always a privilege to minister his word. I'll tell you folks, you don't get around to many meetings and hear singing like we enjoyed tonight. Those good old gospel songs that glorify the, don't that warm the cockles of your heart? I tell you, it's better than some of the stuff we're getting today. Well, open your Bible to the book of Zechariah. That is in your Bible. I checked that one out before I left my room. The book of Zechariah. And find chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. Now let us turn to the Lord of the Word, before we turn to the Word of the Lord, let us pray. Loving Father, we thank Thee for the Holy Scriptures, this miracle book of the ages. We thank Thee for the miracle of its inspiration, for the miracle of its inerrancy, its infallibility, its immutability, its indestructibility, and for the miracle of its influence in our lives. Thank you, Father, for all who came tonight. May none go empty away from this meeting, but may something from thy great storehouse of rich truth find its way into the innermost recesses of the being of everyone present. May we leave this meeting a little taller spiritually than when we walked in. And if anyone came, Father, who has never had a salvation experience, who has never known the joy that, and the peace that comes when our sins have been forgiven, we pray that such a one will trust our Savior tonight. For we ask this in his worthy and precious name. Amen. In 1956, I was installed as the minister of the Highland Park Baptist Church in Detroit. At that time, it was the second largest attended conservative church in the city of Detroit. The man who preached the installation message was the late Dr. H. H. Savage, who at that time had pastored the First Baptist Church of Pontiac for 38 years. In the course of his message, he made a statement that seemed to bother me a little bit. As I thought it through, I had to agree perfectly with him. This was his statement. He said, I believe that the average church in America could carry on with as much success that it is now enjoying, even if the Holy Spirit did not exist. I thought to myself, that's a strong statement. But having ministered in more than 1,500 churches on the North American continent, I agree heartily with the late Dr. Savage. There's a lot of ritual and regimentation in churches today. There's a power that is not the power of God. Some years ago, I was browsing in a bookstore, and the title of a book fastened itself upon me, and I reached for the book, removed it. The title was The Greatest Unused Power in the World. It was written by a scientist. The cover on the jacket was a picture of Niagara Falls, and the scientist sought to prove that if the energy, the power, could be harnessed from Niagara Falls, it would provide all the heat and energy needed for the entire state of New York. He called it the greatest unused power in the world. Dear friends, the greatest unused power in the world tonight is not Niagara Falls. The text I want to draw to your attention by way of introduction is Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might. You may have a modern translation that reads, not by an army. Israel depended on military might 
as they faced Gentile nation after Gentile nation that sought to destroy them and wipe them out. But God said it's not by military might, nor by power, nor by monetary power. Today, most people believe that we can solve our problems with money. The economy seems to be the big issue and all the political activities. But there are needs, dear friends, that money can never buy. There's a need in our churches today. Money cannot buy it. Not by military power, not by monetary power. And then in the New Age movement, we are now trusting mind power. Man seems to have all the answers without God. Not by military power, nor by monetary power, nor by mind power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. For a few nights, we want to consider something of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Every true Christian, every truly born again person, and let me say again that calling oneself a Christian does not make one a Christian. I can call myself a Christian, that doesn't make me a Christian. You can call yourself a Christian, that does not make you a Christian. But every true Christian, every truly born again person is a Trinitarian. Now don't look in your Bible concordance for the word Trinity, it does not appear. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. It was coined by theologians to describe the tri-personal God who does appear in your Bible. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three persons in the Godhead are co-equal and co-eternal. And all three possess all of the essential and the unique attributes of deity without which neither person in the Godhead could be God. Your Bible opens in a very simple way. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The word God there in your English Bible is spelled with a capital G, small o, small d. It's the Hebrew word Elohim. That is a Hebrew plural. And I always read it for what it was intended to mean in the beginning, the tri-personal God created the heaven and the earth. You are a Trinitarian if you are God's child. You believe in a tri-personal God. Now the Old Testament is basically, primarily, the dispensation of the first person in the Trinity, God the Father. Now I'm not suggesting to you that in the Old Testament you do not find God the Son or God the Holy Spirit, you do. As a matter of fact, on page one in your Bible, you read after the statement that God created the heaven and the earth, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So you have the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament active in creation. To say that the Old Testament is basically the dispensation of God the Father does not suggest that God the Son does not appear in the Old Testament. He does. There are pre-Bethlehem appearances of God the Son. Pre-incarnate appearances. Some people have an idea that Jesus Christ began as a baby born in the manger. My dear friends, as long as there has been God the Father, there has been the Son of God. So in these theophanies, and these pre-Bethlehem appearances, you find Christ in the Old Testament. Basically, that's the dispensation of God the Father. When you come into the book of the Acts, you're introduced to God the Son. His birth, his boyhood, his baptism, his battle in the wilderness with Satan, and the beginning of his public ministry. Now to read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in Acts chapter 1, you are in the dispensation of God the Son. Now I'm not suggesting that during the 33 years of our Lord's appearance on earth, the Father and the Holy Spirit were not active. All three were. When you come to the baptism of our Lord, he's standing in the water. And the Spirit of God descends in the form of a dove. Now the Holy Spirit was never a dove. 
that symbolic language. He appeared in the form of a dove, and the voice of the Father thundered forth, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That you have the Trinity, all three persons of the Godhead active, but basically, fundamentally, Matthew 1 through the first chapter of the book of the Acts is the dispensation of God to Son. Now in Acts chapter 1, the Lord Jesus goes up. That is called the ascension of our Lord. He ascended into heaven, and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descended. And that began a new dispensation, sometimes referred to as the dispensation of grace, correct? Or the dispensation of the church, that's correct? Or the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. Now, it doesn't mean that today the Father is not active. He is. Our Lord said in John chapter 10, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. The Lord Jesus Christ is working, not for unsaved people. If you came tonight and you had never been saved, dear friend, let me say it clearly. Jesus Christ is not doing anything for you. All he intended to do for sinners, he did on the cross. If you're not saved, friend, the next move is on your part. You have a choice to make. But he's working. Hebrews 7.25, he ever lives to make intercession for the saints. All three persons in the Godhead are working. But this is basically, fundamentally, primarily the dispensation of God, the Holy Spirit. Now turn in your Bible, please, to the Gospel according to John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And please find chapter 14. In John chapter 13, the Lord Jesus told the disciples that he's going away. He's going to leave them. And it left them troubled. They needed him. After all, he fed them, performed miracles. He guided them. He guarded them. They needed him. And it saddened them to think that he was going to leave them. At the end of chapter 13, after telling them he was going away, Peter began to speak. Verse 36. He said, Lord, where are you going? Whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Peter, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many abiding places, many dwelling places. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you shall be also. Now let me inject a question here by using my sanctified imagination. As I read the story, Peter, I'm sure, was thinking, but Lord, what about the time while you're away? Who's going to care for us? Who will be our counselor, our comforter while you're gone? And the Lord takes care of that. You're now in chapter 14, verse 16. Now the Lord just said, I'm going to my father's house. He said, and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter. You will notice the word comforter is in the uppercase with a capital C, that's the proper noun. That's one of the several names and titles for the Holy Spirit. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now he identifies the comforter in verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Now watch your Bible closely when I ask you a question. He said, but you know him, 
This is my question to begin our study tonight. Do you know the Holy Spirit? Now, my question was not, do you know anything about him? Not, did you ever have a course on, in pneumatology? No. Did anyone ever teach or preach about the Holy Spirit? Oh, yes, I've heard a lot of that. The question is, do you know him? Do you know something about him, or do you know him? Do you know him experientially? Do you commune with him? Do you have any fellowship with him? Have you had any today? It's very important. Our study is designed to bring us into a more intimate fellowship with the third person in the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Now, you will notice in this promise that our Lord gave, he's preparing the disciples for a transition. Let me read on. Verse 17, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him. Now, there are two prepositional phrases here. Watch them in your Bible. He dwelleth with you and shall be in you. At no time during the entire Old Testament did the Holy Spirit ever take up a permanent residence in the body of a believer. He came upon men to endue them with power and ability and skill to perform a work for God, but never took up a permanent residence in the body of a, of a believer in Old Testament times. Now the Lord's preparing his disciples for a transition. He is with you, but Jesus said he will be in you. Now this raises a question, where is the Holy Spirit tonight? How often have I been in meetings when some sincere person, a child of God, would pray for the Holy Spirit to come in that meeting? My dear friends, you could make very certain that the person praying did not understand the scriptures. Where is the Holy Spirit now? Well, he's omnipresent, therefore he's everywhere present. That's one of the essential attributes of deity, without which God could not be God. God is everywhere present. But where is he residing? Jesus said he is with you and he shall be in you. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? 1 Corinthians 6.19 and 20 Paul repeats and then he adds you are not your own you are bought with a price therefore glorify God in your body. Romans 8, 9, if any man has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Has it ever occurred to you that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you've never been born again? And if you have been born again, the Holy Spirit is living in you. You say, I don't feel anything. It's not a matter of feeling. It's a matter of fact. The moment you were born again, the Spirit of God took up a permanent residence in your body. Notice what the Lord Jesus said here. He said, he will abide with you forever, verse 16. I've been saved for 65 years. I was led to Christ in 1927 by an 18-year-old girl who gave me my first Bible and introduced me to the Lord Jesus Christ. During those 65 years as a Christian, I have sinned, and so have you, Christian. If there's a Christian here who has never sinned since you've been saved, let the liar please stand and give his testimony. <laughs> but I can tell you tonight, the Spirit of God has never left me once. He can't. Jesus said when he comes, he will abide with you forever. For 65 years, he has been living in this body. This is the temple 
of the Holy Spirit. He has taken up a permanent residence in the life, in the body of every truly born again person. If Layman Strauss could ever go to hell, the Holy Spirit will have to go with me on the authority of your Bible, and it's always been in your Bible. When he comes, he will abide with you forever. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he has several figures of speech for the church. Now, the church in Ephesians is not a building. It's not a denomination. It's not an organization. The church is a spiritual entity. It is people, saved, born-again people. That's Christ's church. It's not a building. It's not a denomination. The church is people, saved people. And there are a number of figures of speech in Ephesians that sets forth a beautiful picture of the church. In chapter 1, the church is called a body, the church which is his body. In chapter 2, the church is likened unto a building. In chapter 3, the church is likened unto a brotherhood. In chapter 5, the church is likened unto a bride. And in chapter 6, the church is likened unto a battalion. Christ's church is a body that will never die. It's a brotherhood that can never be divided. It's a building that can never be destroyed. It's a bride that can never be divorced. And a battalion that can never be defeated. Christ's church. And the church is people. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 tells us how you get into Christ's church. Now, you can join almost any church in America. You apply, apply for membership. If your behavior is above reproach and you can give the right answers, they'll take you in as a member. Be glad to get you along with your tithe. They'll welcome your membership. You can join almost any church in this country. You can't join Christ's church, my friend. You are joined to it by a power outside, above, and beyond yourself. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Now remember, the first figure of speech in Ephesians is the body. The church which is his body. Ephesians 1, 21, 22. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. That's not water baptism. That's spirit baptism. This is how we get into the body of Christ. This is how we are joined to Christ's church. The moment we savingly believe, the spirit of God places us into the body. Spirit baptism. Baptism, for by or in one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now, I would like to lead you in some simple steps how the Holy Spirit works in the life of a sinner and a believer. I've selected a number of texts, and in each text, you will find two things in every one of them. The first text is Genesis 6, 3. My spirit shall not always strive with man. Now in that text you will find first the mention of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, you will find a verb beginning with the letter S. Last night I gave you those verses and said think them through and be prepared tomorrow night. What is the same in every verse? The Holy Spirit and a verb beginning with the letter S. Our second text will be Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. The Spirit saves. Text number 3, 1 Peter 1, 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God through sanctification sanctification of the Spirit. The Spirit sanctifies. Ephesians 1.13 Upon believing you were sealed 
with that Holy Spirit of promise. That's your assurance. The Spirit seals. Ephesians 3.16, we are strengthened with might by God's Spirit in the inner man. You see, in every text, there's a mention of the Holy Spirit and a verb beginning with the letter S. Let's begin tonight with our first text. Turn back to Genesis chapter 6, please. Now this is a controversial chapter. And it's the kind of a chapter containing some statements that have caused great perplexity among Bible teachers and among theologians, of whom I am not one. I trust I am a reasonable facsimile of a serious Bible student. I make no apology for that. And this is a difficult passage. But no Bible passage can mean two different things in its primary interpretation. And maybe several applications, but no passage can mean two different things in its primary interpretation. And I want you to see the context here in which the text is located. The text is verse 3 of chapter 6, My spirit shall not always strive with man. The striving ministry of the Holy Spirit. This is the initial groundbreaking work of the Holy Spirit, preparing the heart of the sinner for step number two, namely salvation. Let's look at the difficult passage for a few moments. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now the problem here is uh, revolving around a question, who are these sons of God? Now there are good and godly men who believe that they are angels. Uh, if they read the context carefully, you could never come to that conclusion. Totally impossible for them to be angels. Absolutely 100% impossible. They couldn't be angels. Just read the context carefully. This is the chapter where the flood is announced. God's going to bring judgment upon this earth. Verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with angels, no, with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Verse 5. And God saw the wickedness of angels, no, the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and repented the Lord that he had made angels, no, that he made man. Why would God judge the human race if these were angels? Now the term sons of God does not always mean angels in the Old Testament. The sons of, term sons of God is used for the first creations of God. For example, in the genealogical record of Adam in Luke chapter 4, Adam is called the son of God, was the first man. Angels were called sons of God, first creation. God created the holy angels. The nation of Israel is called the son of God, the first nation God set apart. And when a sinner is regenerated, born again, becomes a new creation in Christ, then the regenerated sinner is called the Son of God. First creations. God is not sending the flood upon mankind if the wickedness was on the part of angels. Further, Genesis chapter 1, nine times, nine times, says that everything reproduces after its kind. If angels could reproduce, they would have to reproduce angels. That's the record of the Bible. You plant carrots, you're not going to pull up red beets. You're going to pull up carrots. Everything reproduces after its kind. Angels are spirit beings. They do not have physical organs. If they could reproduce, they would have to reproduce angels. 
everything reproduces after its kind. That's why apes still reproduce apes. There's no evidence for the, for the uh, theory of evolution, the atheistic theory of evolution. You rule God out, it does not make sense. Apes still reproduce apes. I've said on many occasions, I believe there are people who sometimes appear in my meetings, their ancestors might have hung by their necks, but none ever hung by their tails, that's for sure. God created you, my friend. You're not a piece of driftwood on the sea of life. You did not evolve from some lower form of animal. We've been teaching our young people that for years. Now we wonder why they behave like animals. We've been telling them they came from animals. God's dealing in Genesis chapter 6 with the sin, the wickedness of man. In every one of these texts, I've suggested that there is a major doctrine of our historic Christian faith. And it begins with the doctrine of sin. What is the Holy Spirit striving against? <coughs> He's striving against sin. There are times in the Bible where we read that God the Father is holy. On a few occasions, our Lord Jesus has said holy. He's called the holy child. But the Spirit of God is always referred to as the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. In the old Anglo-Saxon, that would be the Holy Guest. Why is he always referred to as the Holy One? Because sin grieves him. He's so sensitive to sin, it grieves him, and he strives against sin. My spirit shall not always strive with sin. Let's turn to the New Testament and see how this ministry of the Holy Spirit functioned when the Holy Spirit descended on the day of Pentecost. Now, again, I could be on controversial ground with some folks. Not all of my brethren believe that the church was born on the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> there are some good brethren who love the Lord. They believe that the church was born later in the book of the Acts. Well, I'm not going to fuss with them. I believe the day of Pentecost was the birthday of the church. If you don't agree with me, that's perfectly all right. When we get to heaven, we won't even be quizzing or quarreling about it. We'll know then, even as we are known. A man came to me some time ago. He said, uh, my pastor read your commentary on the book of Revelation, and he doesn't agree with you on a certain chapter. Oh, huh, it's all right. And he was looking for a little argument. He said, but he didn't agree with you. I said, I know you just told me that. <laughs> and he kept pressing me. He wanted me to get into a controversy. Finally, he said, well, my pastor doesn't agree with you. What are you going to say to that? Well, I said, maybe I have a little bit more to learn about the book of the Revelation. That was the end of the conversation. Now, we all have some more to learn about different parts of the Bible. I believe the church was born on the day of Pentecost. Now, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled, controlled by the Holy Spirit spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. Now there are three signs on the day of Pentecost. Notice verse 2, there was the sign of sound. There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And then there was the sign of sight in verse 3. There appeared unto them. They saw something. They heard something. They saw something. Then in verse 4, there was the sign of speech. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, dialectos, dialects, languages, not incomprehensible babbling. Somebody could speak the dialects and the languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. One man could speak and all could understand him. 
the sign of speech on the day of Pentecost. Now in chapter 2, the Pentecostal sermon is preached. I want you to remember now, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. In the upper room, there was a group of believers filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit means to be controlled by the Spirit. Some few years ago, I was ministering at the Boca Raton Bible Conference in Boca Raton, Florida, and they were dedicating a new building that had been built, and they invited Billy Graham to come and preach the dedication. And being my week of ministry, I was privileged to be present and listen to Mr. Graham as he preached. And he told, uh, gave an illustration in his sermon, and I'll never forget. He and his team were traveling on the plane. And in that plane was a man under the influence of alcohol. He was drunk. Now, drunkards behave differently. Some are rather brutal, could kill. Others like to thrust themselves forth and act like clowns to strut their personality a little bit. This man was one of that kind, seemingly harmless, but a man who enjoyed drawing attention to himself. So he released his seatbelt, stood up in the aisle, and began to clown around. The flight attendant said, Mr. The seatbelt sign is on. You better fasten your seatbelt and please be seated. Well, he sat down, fastened his seatbelt, but under the control of the alcohol, he was unable to do what he was supposed to do. In a few minutes, he was up clowning around in the aisle again, trying to draw attention to himself. It happened the third time, and the flight attendant said, Sir, I'll have to report you to the pilot. He may land this plane in an airport before we reach our destination, and you're going to be arrested, taken off the plane. Now, why don't you please be seated and fasten your seatbelt? At that point, one of Mr. Graham's team members got up from his seat and walked up to the man. He said, Excuse me, sir. But he said, the flight attendant is speaking for your interest and welfare. And by the way, do you know who's on this plane? And the drunk said, no, who's on this plane? He said, Billy Graham is on this plane. And the drunk said, he is? Where is he? I got to shake his hand. I'm one of his converts. <laughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> he could have been one of my converts. He could have been one of my converts. He could have been one of your converts. The point is, if he were the Holy Spirit's convert, he would have been sober. He would be controlled not by the deadly weapon of alcohol. He would be controlled by the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit simply means to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Now, in that upper room, there was a group filled with, controlled by the Holy Spirit. And Peter is appointed to preach the Pentecostal sermon. Briefly, the sermon was, first of all, scriptural. He preached from the Old Testament, that's all he had, the prophets and the Psalms. And it was Christocentric or Christ-centered. And when he finished preaching, a biblical Christ-centered message See what happened, verse 37. Now when they heard this, when they heard what? When they heard this scriptural Christ-centered message, they were pricked in their heart, convicted, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, repent. And after you repent, then you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you too shall receive the Holy Ghost. Now that's conviction. That's Holy Spirit conviction. Now watch verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teaching. There was not only conviction, there was conversion and we know there was conversion because there was continuance. They continued. Where are the so-called converts today in many of our churches? Walking down an aisle is one way of 
confessing your faith in Christ, but you can walk down an aisle and end up in hell. Going into the baptistry is very important for a believer, but you can go into that baptistry a, a dry sinner and come up a wet sinner. That baptistry is never going to save you. But we know there were converts because they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Preaching in a church not long ago, in the church was the announcement, we're canceling the communion service because we have a guest speaker. It'll be held three months from now. Just tack that on to the end of the meeting as though it was not important. These people continued in the breaking of bread, in praying, in following the teaching of the apostles. There was Continuance, verse 46. And they continuing daily with one accord. There was unity among the believers. Go back to chapter 1 for a moment. Verse 14. They all continued with one accord in prayer. Mark the one accord of prayer, please. The one accord of prayer. Chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. That's the one accord of place. Now turn over, please, to chapter 2, verse 46. And they continuing daily with one accord, verse 47, praising God, the one accord of prayer, the one accord of place, the one accord of praise, they were now one. They were knit together. They were baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. They were now one, and they were in one accord. I heard of a little town in Mississippi. I preached in the town. There are three churches, three different denominations. They never fussed with each other, but they never did anything together just never seemed to get along. They all had their separate ritual, the way they did things. But uh, there was an ecumenical meeting planned for, uh, uh, in the state of Louisiana. And uh, gas was scarce during World War II. And one of the ministers, these three ministers were going to attend this ecumenical meeting, decided that to cut down expenses, they would all put together and share their coupons, their gas coupons, and go in one car. And for the first time in the history of that town, those three ministers were all in one accord. The car they went in was a Honda. <laughs> first time. I'll tell you, beloved, when you're in Christ, you're in one family, and the church has one head, and that head is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when every member of the body is in subjection to the head, you're all in one accord, in one place, praising God. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. In the upper room, there was a little group. I have some letters with me. A couple of them are unanswered. Two of them have to do with the church looking for a minister. And uh, they contacted me and said, now you travel all around the country. You must know of some prospect that would be available for our pulpit. Now, I always have a stock question. When someone asked me if I would do that, I said, what kind of a man are you looking for? And it would be amusing if it were not amazing when you consider some of the things that churches are looking for for a preacher. It has to be young and good looking. What that had to do with it, I don't know, but that's one of the requirements. It's just so many different things. Not very many local churches and assemblies will say, we're looking for a spirit-filled man who's a man of God's word. Occasionally, I'll find a search committee looking for that kind of a man. But in closing this introductory study tonight, May I say, dear friends, that you have a right 
to expect in your pulpit a spirit-filled man of the word. But that man, whether he be your pastor or your elder, has a right to expect in his flock spirit-filled people. You see, when you have a group like this group in the upper room controlled by the Holy Spirit and Peter preached the word, there was conviction. That's the striving ministry of the Holy Spirit. The ground-breaking work, not by might, military might, nor monetary might, nor mind might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. When he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness because they believe not on him. I am a firm believer that any assembly with spirit-controlled men in the leadership and spirit-filled people in the pews praying together with one another for one another, there's going to be conviction, there's going to be conversion, and there's going to be continuance. We have a lot of people who make a profession of faith in Christ who fall by the wayside. We brought that out yesterday when I answered a question, why is it that so many churches on Sunday night can find about 25 to 30 percent of their morning congregation worshiping? And I told you last night from the Bible where many people were last night. Now, you folks are here tonight. This is a fine Monday night attendance. Now, you fans know that the kickoff tonight is not until 9 o'clock. <laughs> you know that. Well, you got, I got response on that now, you see. That's the popular Monday night indoor sport. Played usually outdoors, viewed indoors by millions. And would you believe it? There could be some folks who'd be afraid to miss the kickoff, and the preacher may be a little long-winded, maybe I won't go tonight, but you came, and thank God for your presence. We'll continue tomorrow night, show how the Spirit saves. Why does he strive? He strives against sin. Now, <clears throat> thought came to my mind. Say, Brother Strauss, go back to that Genesis 6 passage for a moment. Do you have any explanation for it? I give you a possibility. It is possible for a demon-possessed man to marry a woman and have children. That's a possibility. But for a spirit without organs, physical organs, and not a body, no. No way. No way. But where the Holy Spirit is in charge, the enemy will not take over. Remember Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wear your armor, beloved, and the devil will not be able to get at you. The Lord willing, we'll gather tomorrow night for part two. How does the Spirit save? We're going to deal with the doctrine of regeneration. Tonight, the doctrine of sin. Why does he strive against sin? Tomorrow night, the doctrine of regeneration. Let us pray. Now, if you have a spiritual need, whether it's for salvation, maybe you have a problem, maybe you're going through some deep water, you're having a trial, you're being tested. It's tough to be a Christian many times. It's not always easy, but possibly some of us can be a help to you tonight. And there are brethren in Christ here tonight, and I'd be delighted to sit down with anyone and bring some scripture to you, some comfort and encouragement to your heart. Don't leave without making a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Thank you, Father, for permitting us to be together tonight. Thank you for sending thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you, blessed Holy Spirit, for taking up a residence 
in these bodies of ours. Thou art here tonight, dwelling in these human temples. Grant, Lord, that the sum total of our efforts tonight, the singing of those good old gospel songs, and the opening of thy word will bring forth fruit to the praise, the honor, and the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we ask it in his worthy and holy name. Amen. <clears throat>